Hello. Hello, hello, hello. No, you're not talking to me yet. So I do have Kilt behind the scenes and she is gonna come in and we have, we hope we have absolutely everything fixed now. Our lights, our camera, our action. So join us for the first of our true live streams. No, we don't know. We, we've we started already. We're in the arc. Here we go. Swim. We're here. We did it. We did it now. Ed Kilt, can you please speak so that we can see whether or not everybody can hear us this time? It would be nice. It would yes. be nice if we could. I think I, after I've destroyed my microphone stand and took everything apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell them tell them about how you did that while I see if I can get the chat up. That would be nice. I unscrewed something. Yeah, you were screw loose. That I couldn't put back together. Yeah, exactly. So now I have another, yet another screw loose, <laughs> which I've lost. Uh, well, I've, I want, I want to know whether or not anybody can is in there can talk to us. So I'm going to bring up the chat screen. Oh yes, they're here. Okay, so they can see us. And Casey says hello, ladies. And Mel says finally, Tehe. And Casey says hi, Mel. So we're all here. Um, I seem to be only able to see the chat if I'm actually showing the chat. So the live chat is now showing on screen, as it were. Ladies, you can carry on. <laughs> um, but until I don't, I, I I still don't have something set up correctly to be able to interact with the chat when I'm off the chat screen. So unless I'm showing it, we can't see it. What should we talk about tonight? <laughs> What would you like to talk about, Kilts? I now that I've tormented you what? with sound for days, we've been practicing <clears throat> sound for days. You just torment me. Just pick a different topic and torment me over it for three days at a I time. Can, I can do that. I can do that. Which, but so we had that. We had a feast day yesterday in both the Orthodox and the Catholic tradition. Yeah, we did. I, I, Whose feast was it? Um, I, I don't know. Could it be the patroness of our stream? <laughs> Could it could it be I think it could is could it be in fact the mosaic <laughs> arc and, and we should talk about who she is and in fact why why she is the yes. true mosaic arc. Yes. The feast of the Dormition, the Assumption of Our Lady. How, tell 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 uh, us how you celebrate it in the in the Orth the Coptic Orthodox. Um we've been well, we've been fasting prior to the feast, the the feast of Saint Mary. Um and usually people will go to a liturgy and there's a particular liturgy that's said during the feast um, where we focus on Mary in her role in the salvation of mankind. Um, the, uh, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. What is Mary's role in the <clears throat> salvation of mankind? Some people don't think she really has any. They do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they tell us um, about it constantly in Telegram, how Mary is Mary has zero role in salvation. I mean, what's funny is they'll come in and, and, and yes, we're talking about you. Um, they'll, they'll come in and, and basically say, why are you honoring her? I mean, not even that. They won't even say, why are you honoring her? It's like they'll, they'll quote the 1 Timothy 2.6 line it's 1 Timothy 2 6 isn't it where you know Christ is the one mediator is Christ is is the is the man Christ Jesus and that seems to them yes. to satisfy the claim that well we shouldn't be talking about Mary at all because she can't be anything because Christ is everything yes and then there's the 
<clears throat> the standard line about Mary just being a vessel. She was just a vessel. Just a vessel. I mean that. So just a vessel. Just a vessel. Uh, one of one of my good mm. friends. However, okay, go on, go on. <laughs> However, well, one of my good friends, Sarah well, Jane Boss, um, has a, a lovely little book on Mary. It's just Mary, right? It's like 100 pages or so. And she, she has this meditation on how we think of, you know, we think of vessels now as, you know, containers or something you can just throw away, right? They're cartons, they're mm. disposable, you recycle, maybe you recycle them, yes. but they're, 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 there's nothing precious for us in containers anymore, which is a very interesting, it's like, talk about you know, uh, indictments of modernity that we yeah. don't actually care about the, the, con the, the, the vessels that we make vases or I mean, luggage, maybe the, be the, the only thing that people really attach to is their luggage. Yes. Designer luxury handbags. <laughs> the designer luxury handbags. Um, <clears throat> yes. Well, I mean, when you're shopping at Ikea, I mean, things that are just vessels, it's like, oh, well, you can get another one. They're all interchangeable. Right. Because we live in mass production now. The artisanal uh, production of common objects has almost vanished from the West. It wasn't always the case. But for the, for the ancient Hebrews, I mean, vessels weren't just objects for the sake of having objects. The entire uh, temple religion of the ancient Hebrews was based on specific holy vessels which had been... Um, made sacred for a particular use right so um if we talk about mary as just a vessel in the in the modern world that might conjure the image of a ikea cup but to ancient hebrews that would have uh conjured a very different understanding of what that would mean um and definitely in the orthodox church we have this uh Hebrew understanding of what she is as uh, the vessel of our Lord. It's not Ikea at all. <laughs> right. Well, it's even... Wouldn't be furthest from it. It's even... I mean, we, we, live, we live in the era of the, the denigration of women generally. Um, we have Casey mm -hmm. saying birthing person, right? You know, it's like, yeah, that's, 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 that's the... When, you, when you're not honoring Mary as the mother of God, you're basically the point where women well, i mean even indeed women are women are even less than wombs we're, we're not even wombs yes. <laughs> anybody can have a womb right you yeah. just need to take them out and stick them in other people and you make you can make them you know see-through and mechanical and this this sort of refusal to i mean i i've always thought about his refusal to recognize the the glory of the incarnation the mystery of christ's entering into the world at all right it's like what kind of passageway is god going to use to enter into the world a gate uh you know magic doorways right she's also she's a vessel but she's also a magic mm -hmm. magic doorway for god to enter into the world but to, to get to the point where you if you can't even if you can't honor mary as the mother of god you can't honor women mm. yes well it's very strange because most people that are reading the scriptures and they the, they will read the uh the prophecy in genesis uh that was given just after the fall of adam and eve after they took the fruit and lost their lost the glory um fell out of grace uh, where the lord says that the seed of the woman come to undo the bondage of sin for mankind so the first thing that the lord promised the human race was the arrival of a of a woman whose seed would uh, be our liberation. Um, she's fundamental to that uh, to to that story. She's fundamental to to the 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 role of Christ in the salvation of the the world. Well, the Mandela effect works on that one for sure, <laughs> um, <laughs> because there's there's a you know there's you get into the arguments over uh, the pronoun on whose mm -hmm. whose head is being crushed. I, I mm -hmm. we're actually doing this off the top of our heads. Be impressed. Um, but the the gen no the Genesis you know who is it crushing the head of the serpent and. I mean, in, in the iconography, it's like, well, be Mary's foot with Christ's foot on top of hers, or, you know, it's like, it's, it happened. She mm -hmm. works with Christ always in, in these uh, mysteries. But that, 
it's as as the bears like to say that verse has been grappled a lot in terms of whether or not it's read as the prophecy of of Mary's role of the woman's role and th that's interesting because the oldest I mean it's one of the oldest Christian commentaries on who Mary is is that is Irenaeus of Leon saying she reverses Eve's disobedience so in the so the um. Mary Eve um, twinning and 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 uh, reversal is very very ancient in in Christian tradition um, mm -hmm. She reversed the curse. She rever yeah, she reverses the curse. And in Irenaeus, it's because she obeys um, when God says, you, you know, you'll be overshadowed and, and bear the sun. Uh, and that is, in fact, the, you know, as Irenaeus sees it, the direct reversal of Eve's disobedience and not following the Lord's command. Um, and, and that, I mean, and one that gives Mary free will to start with, she needs to say yes. And that is, that is throughout the medieval tradition, a, a feature of her glory and her humility and all of those things, but that God sends the angel to her and, you know, explains to her how it's going to happen. And then she says, well, let it be to me. He, d he doesn't just, you know, zap her like Zeus, right? Or, or, sed or, <laughs> or seduce her like, like Zeus. He comes in and, you know, he sends mm. his messenger to says, this is, this is what you are going to become. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Lord, the, okay. Now I'm trying to do all these things off the top of my head and well, you just conjured that meme I posted a few yeah. weeks ago, where it's just like naked Zeus running around in uh, in Greece, just disturbing all of these. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> all of these women minding their own business. Uh, but that was the ancient pagan view of um, of uh, of the relations between men and women. I mean, that's the that's the relationship between men and men and women after the fall. Right. Fall and Adam and Eve have gone into a. Um, a way of relating to each other that is much more uh, like slavery. I mean, it's part of the bondage of women. When God said uh, that a woman would serve a man, uh, but it's not it's not in in that holy submission that Mary had with the Lord. Right. Um, we were essentially cast into the bondage of of, of all different kinds of slavery. And rapey Zeus is <laughs> kind of a reflection of that in the in the Greek world. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the Orthodox uh, understanding of her role in in the Church. I mean, there cannot be the Church of Christ without Mary um, willingly serving and surrendering to God in every single way she was asked to do from the beginning of her life to the end. Um, and and possibly this is something that the, the Protestants miss out on because they don't have the iconography that we have in the old church to see that we don't just talk about Mary from the moment that she's betrothed to Joseph mm -hmm. and preparing for that marriage. Um, we talk about her life her parents giving her over to the service of the temple. So she's linked to the temple service from her childhood, which is perhaps something that you need to talk about, Professor, in, in the sense that uh, Gee, where should I see her just a vessel? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's almost as though you're an expert. I, it could be. Subject. could be. I don't know. People t people on Telegram <laughs> tell me I don't you know, know all the time, <laughs> as, as if, it's, if, it's, if it's like you've never considered these problems. Um, uh, okay, so going just going back to to put a put a mark on the the, mm -hmm. the the pagan imagery of her of the gods and you know coming unto the daughters of men as it were the the fallen angels the the demons uh, as it were um, I mean Zeus tricks those women in a variety of ways either taking different forms or um, just seducing them. He does, I mean, what's interesting in the Greek stories, he does kind of take care of them. I mean, Bacchus is simile, as Bacchus is born from his thigh after he burns up, simile burns up because she asks to see Zeus in his, in his magnificence and he does and he burns, she burns up. So Dionysius is born. Well, okay, but whatever. But the, the, the Christian authors in the, the New Testament, Luke, um, is they're definitely trying to show Mary answering all of the Old Testament problems and that Luke has her both, you know, you know, it's a messenger comes to her, the angel comes to her and, and says, um, you know, I bring you these tidings 
and um, thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And we saw in the Habakkuk tech exercise that Jesus in, yes. in the, you know, the scriptures means savior. So it's the same, you shall call him savior. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. Now that that's a pretty intense cascade of, of titles because son of the most high, the most high is a name for, for God. So he is being called son of the something, right? For those who get worried about whether or not Jesus is the son of God, um, uh, that he's sitting, the Lord God shall give him the throne of David, his father, that claim of, you know, Davidic descent becomes a major element in Jesus's arguments about like, who do you say I am, right? What does it mean to be um, the son of David when in the Psalm, David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So who, who is, this is it, this is in the discussion of Psalm 109. Who is it that David's talking about if he's saying that he's not the Lord, right? And, and the reigning in, in the house of Jacob forever I think you probably thought about a lot about that like who who are the who is this jacob who is this israel that we are now talking about yeah definitely because it's not just a physical concept christ is actually and really the heir of the dynasty that was set up uh the house of judah the line of judah it is uh very much uh, a, a royal house in any other way that the uh, the other the houses uh, the other royal houses in the world uh, were set up. Mm. But um, part of the reason why Christ was so mysterious to um, the Hebrews in Judea was that he arrived fulfilling a very different kind of kingship than the one that they were in of Israel. Um, the, I mean, for for anyone who's read the the contentions around his ministry, the, the Jews were very uh, confused about why he wasn't declaring war on the Romans. Mm -hmm. They expected this um, instant kind of uh, overthrow of their um, imperial uh, enslavement to the. To the pagan nation and he was not interested in this at all even though he could have done that if he had decided to do so but he was establishing a kingdom based on a very different set of um principles than the other royal houses of, of the human mm -hmm. race have done so um and and a part of this is linking him to the temple religion linking him to the temple service that was established uh, originally in the, in the tabernacle religion of, of right. Moses. Um, without, without Moses, there is no Israel, obviously, because he is the one that took us from Egypt. But the, this, this religion that the Israelites were practicing was very, very different to the one that was being practiced by the, the nations around them. Um, and it is foreshadowing and showing the Hebrew people how Christ was to enter the world and what his, uh, what his reign was going to look like and what it was going to do for the human race and being the stubborn wayward children that we are. <laughs> <laughs> we constantly we keep, <laughs> keep getting it wrong. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's putting it mildly. Well, I, so the, um, we're, 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 we're working. It's like those who are listening, we see Buzz Sauber and, and Casey and Mel. We have three, an audience of three right now. Um, uh, and um, we're trying to work around to exactly why she's the Ark and, and, and to think yes. about what that means to say, you know, she's the, the vessel. Uh, there's, there's a number of vessels that the craftsmen of the tabernacle and then the craftsmen of the temple are said, well, the, the craftsmen of the tabernacle make the ark, right? So if you've seen the Indiana Jones movie, that's what we're looking for. Um, and yes. the, 
the you know we've we've so touched on the problem of craftsmanship and what a vessel is how mary is is folded into the story of the fall and the redemption um this this more particular story of you know what kind of um lineage Christ is born into and therefore what kind of kingship he has, which then will circle back around in a delightful river run kind of way, commodious vicus of recirculation. We're going to have all that, at least that one page of Joyce memorized, um, to get to the point where we understand why she's all now in the, the, the Orthodox and Catholic tradition she's talked about as a queen, right? And what kind of queenship is this? It's a queenship that's different from the queenship of of Isis, obviously, which is the the claim mm -hmm. that everyone's oh you're pagan you're you're calling her the same name as that pagan goddess. Um, well, you could you know it's easy to you could be saying the same thing about Jesus as being called king. Is he not in fact therefore simply looking like these deities that the the other ancient civilizations are are recognizing? But the the biggest one, uh, it I I was talking about how in Psalm one hundred nine he's recognized. The, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So you have this co-enthronement. And that passage is used a lot to talk about what the, the relationship between the Father and Son is, so therefore the Trinity. Yes. Um, that the, there's, there's two psalms that are very important as enthronement psalms. One is Psalm 2 and one is Psalm 109. And 109 is really important because it talks about how the, the Son has been I, I should have marked all these passages. I'm really doing all this really off the top of my head in ways that I didn't anticipate. See, see, it all just happens. You have to know everything in order to make this argument. <clears throat> um, that in, in Psalm 109, it's, we will put it, we will read it into the stream so everybody knows it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Zion Rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. With thee is the principality in the day of thy strength, in the brightness of the saints. From the womb before the day star I begot thee. The Lord hath sworn, and, be, and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand hath broken kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall judge among nations. He shall fill ruins. He shall crush the heads in the land of many. He shall drink of the torrent in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Um, all, that is the single most important Christological psalm for explaining what kind of kingship Christ is assuming. And with the expectation that, you know, there's power in that. Obviously, he's going to make, make thy enemies thy footstool. Um, but also that he's begotten in the womb before the day star in in, in this, this is the Orthodox tradition. Um, it's not, I'm, you know, not, mm. don't go with, oh, you Catholics think such and such. This is the whole ancient tradition. Um, and yes. that he's a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the letter to the Hebrews, that will become very important, that Christ's priesthood is Abrahamic, right? It's before Moses. Yes. It's before everything, when Melchizedek is bringing out bread and wine from the city of Salem. Um, and yes. that Christ, Christ somehow encompasses all of these ancient titles and and um, roles. It would be very easy to simply look at these psalms and say, as, for example, um, Sigmund Mollwinkel did in his The Psalms in Israel's Worship, say these are ancient fertility cults. You want to go there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you well, know, it's, it's the, the temple worship of all of the peoples in the region was fertility worship, Canaanite temple prostitutes, yes. and um, the expectation that the king himself, like in Pharaonic Egypt, is the god. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, it goes back to Moses. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years from the time that Joseph had entered Egypt as a slave. They spent 400 years in Egypt, so they had been completely uh, immersed in the ancient Coptic culture. They were very much uh, made into Egyptians in that mm. sense. Um, and Moses, I mean, of, 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 of all of them in particular, as we know from the story of the Exodus, 
he was um, adopted into the royal family of the the Egyptian pharaohs. Right. Uh, he gets placed in the basket. The princess finds him. She adopts him as her son, and then he's raised up. So in the scriptures, it says Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts, um, upper and lower. So very much immersed in the the ancient religion of of that empire. And then, of course, he leaves and he's instructed again by his uh, father-in-law, Jethro, who's, who's a Midianite. I don't think that people are giving enough acknowledgement to exactly how much um, of the, the story of the Messiah was contained in those ancient religions um, when, they, when they're worried about there being uh, similarities between this and the 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 cult behavior of of people like the Egyptians or the Phoenicians, people that were living in the areas. Right. Um, it's it's kind of like how do you spend four hundred years in in an empire and gather their understanding of the true God that had been confused and mixed up. You know, Moses was the great prophet in that he gave the Israelites the pure religion of the um, of the Lord, but there was a lot of similarity with the the people surrounding them. There should have been though, because the whole human race have been looking for the same God, the same Messiah. So it makes perfect sense to me um, that there would be a similarity there. I'm trying to I'm trying to link us back to what Moses did in giving the Hebrews that tabernacle religion. I'm looking at Exodus. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> um, but so when I because this is where we find Mary. This is right. where we find Mary very strongly. Right. Moses sees. Well, his sister uh, is named Mary. Yes. Yes, Miriam. Miriam. Yes. His sister is yep. Mary. Right. So our mm -hmm. our image of Moses, Aaron. It needs to be Moses, Aaron, and Mary, who's Miriam. Um, and and there's certainly no accident that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, no. right? It's it's the, the, these these resonances are pur are purposeful in the tradition, and you can say, well, it was her name really Mary? It's like, well, what's his name really Jesus? I mean, they're they're clearly titles as well as as you know in, in, individual names, um, but that that Moses' sister Miriam is part of the Exodus. And she dances. Yeah. She dances at the and and sings at the liberation. Yes. So you have you know our Mary dancing before dancing dancing in in our liberation as well. She and and that's so. This is I I think I when you were talking about Egypt one I went to Charlton Heston. Because, yes. <laughs> because in the Ten Commandments, which I've only at just the NRA Golden Boy recently seen, <laughs> you know Charlton Heston, Yul Brynner, good good pairing, and and the point in that they do a really good job in the movie is showing they grew up together as brothers, right? So when when Moses is having to go up against Pharaoh, he's going up against his brother in the in the um, the palace. It's not just you know Moses by himself. And the, they I. Far be it for me to, you know, quibble over a great movie, but, you know, it's not quite as effective as I thought it was going to be, but on, because they, they, it's like they transform Moses and then all, the, all he can do is sort of, you know, have his staff and be, and be, he, he was much more convincing as the brother of the Pharaoh. But <laughs> there, there you go. Um, Charlton Heston buckled under pressure. Charlton <laughs> kind of buckled <laughs> under pressure. And then, and then the, and the, the, and Yul Brynner, I mean, the, the death of the firstborn is quite poignantly done. His, his son mm -hmm. dies and they have to, you know, um, so there's that. And, the, and then also in the Ten Commandments, when the Israelites go out and Moses has been up on the mountain forever talking to God and getting the, getting the law, and he comes back and they're having an orgy in front of the golden calf. Mm -hmm. All right, that, that I think they staged amazingly well. I mean, whatever Hollywood's doing in the 50s, yeah. they definitely could do stage dances. <laughs> and it's very writhy and, you know, clearly provocative <laughs> and the, just just like they just had and it would, so who was showing us the um somebody in the chat tell us because i think you were showing us today the the this iron bull with glowing eyes that was dragged out at the origin of the commonwealth games right now and oh, they and yes, they did this yes. like, for all you know all intents and purposes this dance before the golden calf it was astonishing 
I mean, so there's there's kind of the we you know what you were saying about the the we have this problem in the ancient world of of saying how much is the Israelite religion distinct from these other temple traditions and practices, mm-hmm. but then on the opposite side we see humanity defaults back into these rituals very in very interesting ways, right? I mean, we've been seen with abortion and the the um the the transformation of men into women. I think I you know I think it's happening right now because of disturb spiritual disturbances in this 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 kind of worship world because the ancient the ancient world has you know lots of traditions of castrated priests. So what was the uh, what was the what's the most striking example of the castrated priests? Well, the the great mother, <laughs> the, mm. the 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 the, the uh, castrati who serve the great mother. They were Roman. No, um, you. I think you're asking me in a way that you know, and I've forgotten off the top of my head. It's in one of <laughs> it's in one of Milo's articles, the Gali, right? The the ah uh, yes, yes 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 to the the, the trannies of uh, of Asia Minor. Indeed, indeed, and they, and they did. They dressed up as women in their processions, mm. and um, the Romans were quite horrified by them. But then the Roman the Ro- the Romans get to be alternately horrified and 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 titillated by these these fantastic religions, including Christianity. Eventually, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, part of part of part of the problem for students of religion, as as you know, stu- historical students of religion, is disentangling our convictions about what religion is thanks to Christianity, because Christianity transforms all of this, um, from our convictions that the Israelite religion was was necessarily different from all of these other traditions, from, and this is where Sigmund Mowinkel's book is very interesting, from, in fact, the true continuity from the temple tradition into Christianity. Mm-hmm. And I have, I was like, if, if I get myself in trouble in academia for a variety of things, this is the one that I've actually gotten myself in the most trouble for. <laughs> um, because <laughs> one, I published it as my, you know, second major monograph. Um, and two, yeah. it, it's, it's a strong argument for this, um, you know, Christ fulfilling the Psalms, which are sung in the temple, which have this yeah. character, as we've just shown in, in Psalm 109, of you know, divine kingship as resting on the Solomonic kings in yes. some way that they, that they, it, you know, Solomon is filled with wisdom. Being filled with wisdom is being filled with the divinity in some way. And, you know, to the, to what degree are any of these kingships, the Pharaonic or the Solomonic, not in fact divine rulership of your, your people? You know, in the person of the the, the human being. I mean, this is the incarnation yes. comes out of this. You know, you could say it's it's straight up. You know, it's the Pharaoh. He's the divine the divine king yes. or Caesar, right? It's like what the Romans be sort of reverting to recognizing the emperors as gods. Mm-hmm. I had a similar concept in Mesopotamia as well, um, but Christ would not have been able to claim. Uh, what he did unless the ancient people had had that expectation I think Uh, talking to pagans about uh, the arrival of the Messiah was easier when the apostles were going to speak to them about the um, you know the uh, of this divine king although it didn't really work with the Greeks very well but um the Hebrews were expecting it. The Hebrews very much were expecting right. uh, a, a, a flesh and blood descendant of David right. to assume this imperial kingship over the earth. Um, but uh, well, I mean, if you say it that way, what's interesting is the Israelite the, the 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 expectation of an earthly Messiah is much more like a Pharaoh. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, straight is. up. And that's and that's why Christ, in fact, makes it very difficult to understand who he is, because he's insisting mm. on the one hand, as Luke is saying, that he's the throne of David. He's going to see, be seated on the throne of David. But he's not, in fact, going to, to claim the earthly power that mm. the 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 um, 
see, and it's getting difficult to name which tradition we're talking about because in the temple tradition, this is the this is the mystery of the ark, right? It's the footstool, yes. or the seat. It's it's the throne where the presence appears, which is getting us yes. to Mary, right? Yes. And 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 yet, it's not a throne that a, that the king sat on. Mm. Well, in the Coptic art and um, the other Orthodox traditions, I uh, have a very similar depiction of of Moses talking to the Lord in the burning bush. Mm. But this is a very this is a very um, well loved and central icon in the Coptic tradition because of course the cops being the ancient egyptians are very um in love with the story of the exodus being that they were the uh the enslavers of the hebrews that have now been uh liberated by the the king of israel mm. so they have a particular love of this story the cops, that they're the cops do. yeah yeah absolutely um because they're living proof that that uh, the son of David has indeed made the the earth his footstool, he has conquered his own enemies. The the, I mean, it's quite a miracle that the Egyptian people embraced Christianity, um, uh, because they have accepted a, a Hebrew Messiah. You know, mm -hmm. they they've um, they've been conquered culturally by Christianity in that sense, although uh, they're still very much Egyptians. But um, uh, that's a good point. We Mar always, I mean, the, the Europeans were, we, we don't pay enough attention to Egypt. We really should. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the, the oh, well, the, Ro the, the focus always on Roman Catholicism is always t what, what happened when Rome took over. Took, yes. took, but think about what happened for Egypt. This is important. Yes. Uh, the I mean, the ancient they're, they're, Egyptians... They're taking over the religion of the people I mean, in, in the terms of the Jews, right? Which is, is complicated. Yes. The religion of the people who were their slaves. Yes, yes. This, this, was not a, this was not a respectable religion by any sense of the word to the ancient Egyptians. They've, uh, I mean, I, I have Egyptian friends that have explained to me very plainly um, while laughing about it. Egypt has never known a time without slavery. It's, it's right. A, it's an unimaginable reality to have lived in a world or a political system where you don't have a pyramidal structure of this aristocratic uh, class of overlords that are then going, you know, r ruling over this huge body of people. Mm -hmm. On the bottom of that pyramid were the Hebrews. Absolutely, rock bottom. Uh, they considered them to be... Um, uncivilized because they lived with animals they were pastoralists the egyptians were not uh, particularly fond of pastoralists they they thought people that lived like this were savages because of course the egyptians were the original civilized civilized people they were, they were civilization so it's very strange right. when people are focusing so much on the roman conquest uh, i see this a lot when i'm reading um a lot of americans discussing colonialism in Africa and how mm. Christianity is a part of, you know, the Roman, Greco-Roman domination of Africa. It's just not true. It's just not true. Um, I mean, Africa was imperial before Greeks even existed. And uh, Christianity arrived as a slave religion, and it was mocked. Um, St. Mark the Apostle arrived and brought the faith of a, of a resurrected Hebrew to the Hebrews' previous slave masters, and they mm. thought they were mad. Mm. Um so Christ conquering Egypt is, is, a, is a beautiful proof that the prophecy surrounding the Davidic, uh, the Davidic Messiah uh, governing the nations has very much been realized oh, in yes. Jesus Christ. Um, and for the Egyptians, their focus uh, in, in terms of the iconography of this, um, the beginning of this story is, of course, when Moses flees after slaying this, the taskmaster. Uh, you know, he's observing the treatment of his fellow Hebrews by the Egyptian slave masters, and he's infuriated by by what he sees, and he slays one of them and has to flee Egypt. And while he's in the wilderness, he's going out, and he becomes uh, 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 immersed in the tribe of the, the Midianites. But his vision of God, when he first starts to hear the voice of the God of Israel, who is Christ, uh, how does he see him? Uh, manifested 
it's in the, the burning bush. Mm -hmm. The Copts always depict the burning bush as Our Lady holding her son. Right. Because she is the tree who was not consumed by the divine fire. So her womb carried the, uh, the creator. The creator stepped into his creation through a created creature. And yet this woman was not consumed by his presence in her body. So we, as Copts, we see the burning bush as Our Lady and her son, the, the, uh, the Lord of Israel. So that's kind of the beginning of it, and this is what Moses is trying to show the Hebrews when he's bringing them out of Egypt and bringing them out of Pharaonic religion, right? Or the the Pharaonic culture, um, which had enslaved them, in that they had been taken into a system where they could not access God themselves. They had to go through this um, Egyptian power structure and uh, all of the magic and things that were involved in that. Um, so Moses purified the purified the religion of the Hebrews, giving them the, the tabernacle. But for the Copts, they understand that what he saw in the wilderness was Our Lady holding uh, our Lord. So it's uh, very obvious to the ancient Christians of Egypt that uh, Miriam, Saint Mary, the Blessed Virgin, is a part of the story of the scriptures from the Exodus. Right, right. Mm. And that, so thinking about, I mean, we're sort of introducing lots of themes in our in our live stream yes. here, and one is this image of Mary and Christ together. If you look in the last image in our intro, there's the collection of the Maestas, the different images of the of Christ surrounded by the, the evangelical animals in the Book of Kells and in some of the ancient uh, the medieval um, uh, decorated book covers and such, but there's also a picture that's a painting, which is from an apse in Egypt. It's Bawit, and it's it's a famous apse because there's a series of these out in the, the the middle desert in Egypt. Very very ancient paintings, and it's Christ in majesty on the the chariot of the cherubim with the eyes and the wings and and everything. But above b below him is Mary holding him in her, you know, it, as the baby enthroned. So this, yeah. this recognition of Mary's framing him is, I mean, it's very ancient and it's, it's, it's not, obviously it's not exclusively Catholic, Roman Catholic. Uh, it's, it goes and it's, it's throughout all of the Old Testament references that the ancient tradition sees of how does the Lord become present to his people? And so you, as mm -hmm. the, the, the burning bush, the medieval Christians in the West know that, that, that imagery as well. It's, it's throughout this ancient tradition. It's so interesting that, um, one, that so much of this now in the West is associated solely with, you know, Rome, because it's, it's not Roman. It's, it's much more ancient than that. And that it, it's divorced from the very fulfillment of prophecies that the Gospels were written to, to prove which yes. we can sh we can keep showing that more in in Luke. So we have um the the psalms revealed as, you know, descriptions of the Davidic kingship which Christ Je Jesus Christ describes as his fulfilling it, but it's different from well, you're going to expect this kind of savior that's your king, that's your earthly king, which is clearly what the people in his own lifetime expected. So he's not really yes. fulfilling. He's he's turning everything upside down. And then in um in Exodus, when Moses is given instructions on making the tabernacle, one important thing is he gets those instructions on making the tabernacle from the same place he got the Ten Commandments <laughs> up on the mm -hmm. mountain, right? He's being yes. he's being shown the pattern on the mountain of how to build this this tent this tabernacle, the tent of the worship, and he's being shown yes. the pattern on the mountain of all of the vessels to be used in the worship in the tabernacle, and in the letter to the Hebrews. In the New Testament, which both talks about Christ as priest according to the order of Melchizedek, it's specifically saying Christ fulfilled this pattern, right? We had the worship in the tabernacle in, in the way that it was shown to Moses on the mountain. Now we have the truth of that worship through Christ, and therefore yes. the, the, the Christian tradition and this is you know the strong version of what I've argued in my Mary in the Art of Prayer, the Christian tradition is the absolute 
direct fulfillment of that temple worship, the tabernacle temple worship. And the, the, this mm. is the way in which um, the ancient, all of the ancient Christian communities saw it. The, the Syrian, the with Ephraim yes. of Syria, the, the Coptic, the G Greek, the, it, well, what's, what the yes. tragedy for modern Christianity is we've lost touch with all of these, all of these ancient stories about Mary, about Christ, about the fulfillment of the prophecies. And you know, the flip yes. side of that is you're having to convince people that these prophecies have been fulfilled for whom these prophets are not their, their native prophets either, right? Yes. Which is, is a sort of astonishment. Well, that's where the miracle of the conversion of the nations right. is so stunning because Israelites were expecting this. The Hebrews were expecting this. Um, and, uh, I mean, without, without the temple of religion, Christianity really doesn't make much sense. So I think this is where a lot of the, the confusion comes in particularly with the Protestant denominations and people arguing over particular scriptures, mm. um, that you do that when you're not focused on the temple religion and Christianity as the fulfillment of that temple religion. Right. And the nations were not familiar with that temple religion. They had their own cults, you know. So the... The reality is that the... The Hebrews uh, were the ones that spread Christianity. It, it, from the beginning, the early church was in every way Hebrew. It was Israelitish. Um, the, the liturgy was written. The first liturgy, as practiced by the Apostolic Christians, was written by Saint Mark the Apostle, who is the, who is the apostle who uh, converted Egypt. Mm. Uh, he's depicted as a lion in the in the four evangelical creatures, um, and Mark, Saint Mark, was a Levite. So he comes from that priestly tribe. He comes from uh, the tribe that were granted no physical territory in the Commonwealth of mm. Israel. They were they were sort of living amongst the other tribes, and they they received a form of. Um, uh, you know, economic support to kind of exist in amongst all of the other tribes, even though they weren't cultivating the land in the same way, and they didn't have, you know, they didn't have a, a territory. Their 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 presence in in the in the tribes was a completely different um, uh, form of uh, participation in the economic life of, of the Israelites. They were the religious the religious ones. So Saint Mark, he is the one who creates the liturgy. It's not an accident that he was mm. a Levite. He's also the one whose house that the apostles were dining in when they first um, sat with our Lord to to participate in with him when he gives them the blood and bread. Mm. So we have this presence of, of, of the Levite and the, and the tribe of Levi in the revelation of Christ as a priest uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. Right. This is an older order. It precedes the mosaic. It precedes... Right, and that's very um, clear in the letter to the Hebrews. Yes. That he's the priest according yes. to the order of Melchizedek, not, the, not yes. the Levitical order that comes later with Moses, but the very, very yes. ancient for all of the nations. Yes, because yeah. Christ, Christ is not a Levite. But the Levites understood very well that there was the, the, the priesthood, which was, uh, you know, um, superior to the Levitical priesthood, and that was the Mel Melchizedek priesthood. Mm -hmm. So Saint Mark understands this. He gives the liturgy, and uh, this is this is the priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood is the one which the Hebrews carried with them after the resurrection of Christ, understanding that now the temple religion had been completely um, uh, fulfilled. Um, it was redundant. They didn't need physical sacrifices anymore. The son of David had arrived, and his kingdom was very much established physically, right. but with a completely different um, uh, way of uh, <laughs> manifesting empire than the than the empires of men. Right, and it was not it was not going to be done with uh, the domination of the Romans or the um, 
the Greeks or, you know, the Egyptians or the Persians. This one was different. It is right. different. And I think, I mean, it's, we have to keep saying that over and over and over again. It's like, oh, well, Christ is, he, Jesus is just, it, it just fits in with all of these ancient expectations. Like, no, it really doesn't. <laughs> On the one hand, mm -hmm. it fulfills the prophecies. It fulfills the worship that's given to Moses and the, the, then Solomon carries, David and Solomon carry on. But it also transforms and transfigures that worship. And yet the church carries it. Right, it's like the you know, it's like why yes. do you, why why do Catholic and Orthodox churches need to be so magnificent and gold covered? Well, let me read you to the description of the pattern that Moses has given. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell in the midst of them. Okay, so the Lord is going to dwell in the midst of them, but I mean, he's traveling with them in the desert as a pillar of fire and a cloud, which the both of those are in the medieval tradition understood as Marian images too. Every time you have a frame for the the presence, you have an understanding of Mary as um, she who makes him visible, right? How, how, how does yes. the Lord become visible? Um, they shall make me a sanctuary and I shall dwell in the midst of them according to all the likeness of the tabernacle, which I shall show thee and of all the vessels for the service thereof, and thus you shall make it. Frame an ark of satin wood, the length whereof shall be of two cubits and a half, the breadth a cubit and a half, the height likewise a cubit and a half. And thou shalt overlay it with the purest gold within and without, and over it thou shalt make a golden crown round about. It's like the rim mm -hmm. on the, the top, right? And four golden rings which thou shalt put at the four corners of the ark, let two rings be on the one side and two on the other, and thou shalt make bars also of satin wood and shalt overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put them in through the rings that are in the sides of the ark, that it may be carried on them. And they shall always be in the rings, never shall they at any time be drawn out of them. And thou shalt put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Thou shalt also make a propitiatory of the purest gold. The length thereof shall be two cubits and a half, and the breadth a cubit and a half. Thou shalt make also two cherubims of beaten gold on the two sides of the oracle. Let one cherub be on the one side. These are very detailed instructions, <laughs> which is, you know, just fascinating. It's like, oh, you know, we, you shall have no graven images, except for we're going to give you deep, deep, you know, artistic ex instructions on exactly how to make my vessels. Um, so clearly we're not meant to worship the calf, but we are meant to honor the presence with appropriate ornament and vessels, right? Um Two cherubims of beaten gold on the two sides of the oracle, that one cherub be on the one side and the other on the other. So cherubim on both sides, right? Let them cover both sides of the propitiatory, spreading their wings and covering the oracle. And let them look one towards the other, their faces being turned towards the propitiatory, wherewith the ark is to be covered. Uh, so this is the, and then the ark is going to be the mercy seat, right? The, it's, it is the throne of the presence and is going to be placed first in the tabernacle and then David carries it up to Jerusalem, dances before it, and Solomon builds the temple where they they place the ark in. Where is the ark now? Well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if we're talking about the physical ark or if we're talking about she who the ark was... Uh, yeah. I don't to. know. Which one are we talking about? Um, do we go Indiana Jones? Oh, but I go Indiana Jones first. <laughs> well, according to the Ethiopian Coptic tradition, <laughs> that particular physical ark resides in Ethiopia after being stashed in um, various uh, places along the Nile over the mm. millennia. There's a there's a um, a national mythos, the national myth of the Ethiopian uh, Christian civilization, which is called the Kebra Nagast, which means the glory of kings. And this particular myth outlines the meeting of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon after she arrives um, on all of her dromedaries from uh, her Sibian kingdom. And she brings, of course, with her spices and precious stones and... Um, other assorted gifts to him hearing his fame and his wisdom she wants to press him with hard questions mm. and uh receive wisdom from this um, i i love this she you know, the queen of sheba shows up and she gives him a, a test right i, I yes. the, 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 and and the, it's a woman testing him on his knowledge 
of all stories. Yes, how, can, how, how can you, how can anybody ever say that, that, that this tradition doesn't give women high status? It, 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 it befuddles me. Women shit, women shit testing. Yeah. Men. Yeah. Really? Sheba shows up and shit tests Solomon for real. Sorry, mm -hmm. not clean speech, but she does. She, she, she's going to test him. Okay. So she shows up and tests him. Sometimes the vernacular is the only uh, one. We, we do. We um, do poetry in the vernacular. We do. Um, so according to the Kebra Nagas, the, the Queen of Sheba, she meets Solomon. She presses him with hard questions. She's knocked uh, sideways man's wisdom. And then, of course, he's invited her to stay because she's travelled a long way. I mean, this is this is a... This is not a, a an international flight. She's just ridden <laughs> camels halfway across the planet to see the man. And um, he, in this mythology, uh, tricks her into breaking a promise, which, uh, of course, she's made uh, to him on the condition that if she breaks the promise, he can have his way with her. So she has, she has been... At that point, there's, I'm married. There, 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 there's a tr medieval tradition of Solomon, Solomonic riddles and so forth, right? You, you clearly, that you want to develop this, um, this little narrative. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, uh, in the in the ancient way of viewing it, obviously Solomon has all of these wives, hundreds and hundreds of wives, right? So she doesn't want to marry him because then she'll just be a co-wife. She's not going to be the wife. Mm -hmm. So. Sheba doesn't want to be co-wife. She wants to be the wife. But, of course, she messes up, and he gets to have his way with her. So she falls pregnant in this myth, and she returns to her own country with uh, a son in her womb. Um, and she leaves, and Solomon gives her uh, Levites to take with her back to her kingdom so she can establish the worship of the God of Israel mm -hmm. in her empire. So according to this myth, uh, the the Queen of Sheba leaves with representatives of all 12 tribes with her and they return back to her country, which is ancient Sabia. We would know that now as the borders between Ethiopia and Yemen across to Oman. Mm. Uh, so it covered a, a large area across the Red Sea. And so that's where all of these uh, afro Shemites. Uh, arrive and starship of, of the, the God of Israel. So this is the mythology that comes along with it. Um, I forget how I got onto this. You asked it's me. Good. It's good. It's good. These stories. And and the thing is, this the the demonstr we're you know doing. A, I hope a, a, a good demonstration of if you really want to know the scriptures, you you're you're. I mean, I'm sitting here with multiple pages and such like that, and you have to read the bottoms and the concordances. And the expectation should be that these stories are constantly pointing to each other across the book, yes. right? It, it's like what yes. we're trying to say of reading the mosaic arc is multiple layers already, right? It's the arc that Moses, that is shown to Moses on the mountain. It's this mosaic of references and associations and layers and figures. It's the crossing of these times, the, the, the time stories. It's recognizing, yes. re I mean, recognizing that the traditions are, there's, there's this wonderful traditions going out into the technical term being the diaspora of of mm -hmm. of the Hebrews into the whole ancient world. I mean, I as a yes. historian sometimes am bothered and troubled. It's like why does why does Jesus come when and where he does? It's like, well look at the world at the time that he mm -hmm. he is incarnate. When he's um crucified, he's got the three uh languages naming him as the king of the Jews. So it's the, under the Roman yes. Empire, but the Greek we 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 tend to think of the Greeks as oh yeah they're in Greece and they're Plato and Aristotle no, they were they were all over the ancient world because of Alexander the Great, yes. and yes. you know because of Alexander the Great the pharaohs by Jesus's time were Greek, <laughs> since they're the Ptolemies, and the, Alexander's empire had reached all the way to India so there's the, the you know the oh. the whole world had been brought into this network of commerce and storytelling and worship and law um it's not all in, it's not absolutely all under the romans but they're in you know this constant tension with their eastern neighbors and yes. um if you look if you look at the world in that map 
Jerusalem really sits right there in the middle of all of that. It's, it, it makes it makes sense as a center of this um, peoples. And at Pentecost, when the apostles are speaking, um, at, you know, filled with the Spirit, they're speaking to all of the nation people from all of these different nations with all these different languages who are all there for the the, the feast for the feast of Pentecost. Yes. So yes. this this cosmopolitan character of the ancient world is the the that world is what Christ is is born into. Yes. Well, the the nations or the Jews it should be correctly said that they were Israelites that had returned Good. to yes. Jerusalem for the feast. Because we're not just talking about the tribe of Judah, we're talking about the entire diaspora which included any uh remaining um, uh, Israelites from those ten northern kingdom tribes right. that had been scattered around, um, and the 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 Jews or the the Israelites that had come to um, the feast during the Pentecost included those diaspora that had been sent down to the ancient Sabean kingdom, but it included African Israelites, right? Who had um, Ethiopia been is mentioned for, all the time. I mean, it was it's, it's the most mentioned in, in yeah, Habakkuk I think, that I read the other day. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's I think in the it's Psalms. one of the most commonly mentioned nation in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It was so important to the biblical story. So whether or not the myth of the Kebra Nagast is real, um, the point is that mythologically, these ancient uh, African Israelites considered themselves to be descendants of this meeting. Right. And this is why they always said the Ark is here, the Ark is in Ethiopia, because when the, the son of this... Uh, <laughs> wild night between Shiva and Solomon grows up, he says, I want to go and see my father. And uh, she says, okay, you can go. So, of course, he, he returns. He travels back to Jerusalem to meet Solomon. Solomon sees him and immediately knows, oh, it's my boy. And then they meet together and he talks with his father. And, of course, they exchange um, uh, tr training and governing a, a kingdom. When the son of Solomon leaves uh again with some more representatives of the of the tribes to take with him back to his kingdom he in the story takes off with the ark so there it is they're digging in the wrong place so that's, that's <laughs> it's yeah. not in tanis <laughs> it's in ethiopia so, um, and it's there now as according as, to their yes, tradition it's, it's, according to their tradition it's still there um it's part of the liturgical life of the ethiopian coptic church they have a great emphasis on the presence of the ark of the covenant mm -hmm. Uh, every church in Ethiopia has something called a tabot, which is a replica of the, the ark. They're covered, they're venerated. Um, but of course, in the Ethiopian tradition, they're not looking at it merely as a... Uh, as, uh, copies. As a vessel. Copy. And it's not as, just copies of Solomon's ark, or which is Solomon's yeah. ark was Moses' ark. It's yes, the same, but they same are, vessel. Same vessel. But they are also very aware that that vessel was pointing to Our Lady. Right. So you see, along with this incredible veneration of the Tabot um, or the Ark, you will see the emphasis in Ethiopia on Our Lady. She is everywhere, right. everywhere. Right. Um, and there is not one without the other. So in terms of the African Israelites who adopted Christianity, they have carried with them a very strong Solomonic cultural tradition throughout the liturgical practice. And so when the Christian church was established, when the apostles announced that the Messiah had arrived and fulfilled his, um, uh, has had established his kingdom, Christianity found its way back down into the population of African Israelites and that they uh, christened what they had been practicing previously. Right. So... And, th of course, this is the tradition that I found before entering into the Orthodox Church. I think, personally, I needed to see it. I needed to see the Israelite nature of the religion in order to understand. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, Our Lady is the Ark. Our Lady is the Ark. She is the Ark of the Covenant, of the New Covenant. Well, what I what I like about what I've, I've learned in our conversations over the last few years, I come to this mystery through, you know, Presbyterian scripture study as it yes. were and and the desire to see the history behind the scriptures and the mm -hmm. problems of transmission of the stories and and so forth and you've come to it from the the um ethiopian coptic 
story and it's it's wonderful when we when i remember the one of the very first things you showed me was a painting in a ethiopian church that you, you were just I, here i want to show you this this painting and uh, it, it no because the squeals right there were squeals <laughs> <laughs> many squeals because i kept recognizing things you were showing me as what i had been studying from the western tradition East, as it were, right? That I'm studying the medieval tradition and finding out they knew all of this in yes. the 13th century in France. That's why they're building Chartres as this magnificent mm -hmm. Ark of Our Lady, that they are seeing her in all of these references and, and stories. They have many of the ancient stories too, like her growing up in the temple and so forth. Um, yes. And they recognize her as the temple and the ark and the the all of these great vessels for the presence of of the Lord. And I got very excited by the work that this um, Methodist uh, Old Testament scholar Margaret Barker had been doing because she was finding it the same sort of resonances from the other direction, right? Looking at uh, the ways in which things like she started with the book of Isaiah actually started with book of Enoch and then she worked through Isaiah showing that things like the prophecies of the angel of the Lord make sense of what the Christians actually saw fulfilled in Christ that there, there were these there were these prophecies and that we we talk now about Christianity as as being the the heir to Judaism that's completely wrong because Judaism comes com, you know mm. develops as a as a, a you know a, a tradition after the rejection of the temple tradition is fulfilled in Christianity. And and there's there's rabbis that say that now. It's like the, they see them they see Judaism oh, yeah. as superseding on Wikipedia. superseding Christianity because Christianity is still the the more ancient version of things. It's polytheist. It's it's you know this problem of how do you recognize the there's a book that Peter Schaefer did, he's a Princeton scholar, on um the two mm -hmm. angels of Israel, right? The two gods of Israel, and and it, the, these this angel imagery, the son of the Most High that Luke is pointing to, it's all in this ancient temple tradition of the anointing of the king as the son of the Most High, which is what, mm -hmm. in Luke's story, Gabriel tells Mary, Jesus is going to be her son. Jesus is going to be he's going to be the king in in this tradition. Yes, I. I'm I'm just thinking, you know, when people are talking about Christianity being this kind of uh, offshoot of Judaism, I think it's because people are not really understanding what was going on at Pentecost. Right. This feast that was being uh, celebrated was Israelite in every way. It was a temple right. feast. The Hebrews that had arrived in Jerusalem, they were not converts. These are flesh and blood children of the the tribes that left Exodus. Uh, left Egypt during the Exodus, so the the people that heard all of the apostles, all of the disciples speaking in their tongues, were looking at Hebrews speaking to other Hebrews that had been absorbed into all of these various nations right. around them. Christianity, from the beginning of the gifting of the Holy Spirit to the church, has been pointing towards this enormous Israelite diaspora. Mm -hmm. The church is. So the understanding maybe that we've just come from an offshoot, I'm not really sure if it's people are forgetting that that feast was what it was, but the conversion of the, uh, of the Israelites, you know, that, that's the central uh, commission to the to the apostles at that time was gone preached to all nations they had to start with the hebrews that had been scattered throughout all of those nations it was only right, later the lost israel. sheep of israel yes 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 and so there's no distinction between where the hebrews had been scattered if they'd been in the iberian peninsula what we know as modern day spain or if they'd been thrown out into uh arabia felix in modern day yemen or mm -hmm. ethiopia or india or persia or italy or greece we were everywhere and it was very obvious that the the apostles understood this because they were running around <laughs> yes there's all the, the medieval everybody? traditions of how they go to the, everywhere in the world right there's early spanish maps these beatus apocalypse maps showing the world map of the world and where all the apostles went mm -hmm. um and, and there's very ancient indian traditions of thomas that, yes. that, that he goes there i mean when the the jesuits show up they're already christians <laughs> 
um, yeah. because because of this, yes, this this spreading the the, the 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 spreading, and of course because they're not actually you're calling them Hebrews or Israelite, but they're mainly speaking Greek, which is why they have the Septuagint, yes. and it's why the the Christian New Testament authors depend on the Septuagint for their their scriptures, and why it's I've said this in a lot of streams, but we're saying this now into this the, our new one ours right. Um, why new uh, Septuagint scholarship now recognizes that the Septuagint was the ancient tr tradition, um, that, that the modern yeah. Hebrew differs from it is um, not an indication that the Septuagint was mistranslated. And, and, and the New Testament recognizes the way in which Christ fulfills the prophecies as they're recorded in the, in the Greek. And so the Orthodox Church uses the Septuagint as its as its scriptures. Yes. Well, the the Hebrews had been Hellenized. Right. I liked memeing. I liked memeing about right. that on my channel a lot, but uh, very much they'd been he completely Hellenized. Well, everybody's been mixed up so, in in this in this story, right? Mm -hmm. We have the Ptolemies who are Greek ruling Egypt. We have, <laughs> we have the Israelites in Ethiopia. We have the mm -hmm. you know the Israelites scattered from India to Spain. Um, and yes. so when Christ comes, it is to the whole world, clearly to, and two different nations, you know, that the nations are clearly there and the nations are constantly mentioned in, in the Psalms as he will be, he rule the nations. So all of the different peoples, um, but mm -hmm. his coming in time, it makes, it makes, you know, sort of story sense as, as well as, well, God's going to pick the right time because he knows how to make an entrance, but he, <laughs> Um, it, 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 <laughs> yes. there, there is a human sense of at, at this moment in, in, in human history, all of these cultures are ready to be able to hear. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so how do we, go, they, go ahead. Oh, oh, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, they had, they'd been absorbed into a, a an international empire. Right. So Greece was like global homo. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, everyone speaks Greek, everyone's been Hellenized, so they were primed for that international communication because right. for the first time uh, we had that enormous land, uh, land mass, you know, that enormous amount of, of territory speaking the same language. So Christ could not have done what he, had, what he did uh, and obviously what he decided to do in arriving as the Alpha and Omega unless everyone understood what the alpha and omega was right right mm. okay now now you think we're going off we need to figure out where mary is we pull the, pull the, pull all these okay. threads in right so we say that the the christianity is fulfilling this this temple these temple prophecies and recovering yes. the ark right that the ark is gone i mean yes. that's that's where the the ethiopian story has you know plausibility because we don't know where the ark is um, mm -hmm. And yet, it's very clear that the New Testament authors think they know. Um, and there's and there's two ways that um, is shown. One is in Luke, exactly where we were looking uh, after um, Gabriel comes to Mary and 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 tells her that she's going to be the the mother of the Most High. She goes and visits her sister, her cousin, sister, her cousin Elizabeth. Right again, another of these great mm -hmm. two pregnant women meeting, and their and their children leap in their wombs at the recognition of each other. Clearly showing that yes, life begins in the womb. Um, <laughs> um, there's wonderful medieval images of of that visitation, right? Of this meeting of the two pregnant, the two pregnant mothers, and Mary's like three months pregnant. No, Mary's. Elizabeth is six months pregnant and Mary is newly conceived. But anyway, so John leaps in his mother's womb and all of the language in the description here, which is also going to end up with Mary singing the Magnificat, right? The first great Christian song Mary sings, my soul doth magnify the Lord. But her going, her traveling and going up to the mountains and such, Scott Hahn is a, a lovely reading of this in his Hail Holy Queen of how Luke is very purposefully um, replicating in his narrative David's taking the ark up into, into Jerusalem, um, and mm. and you know coming to the, the Elizabeth comes out to meet the my Lord in Mary who's carrying the Lord who's carry is is the ark carrying it, and and you can tell that this is a temple story because of the first chapter in Luke where we have 
um, John's conception and his his father serving in the temple, right? So we we're, we just replete with temple imagery. Of course, Mary is the ark, the physical vessel of the Lord, who is going to be there for. And this is where you know the proper the properness in the in the in the Christian tradition is that she is. She has to be as pure as she is because what else? Are, what else is going to be the the carrier for the Lord? I mean, there's there's a kind of logic to yes. it. Um, there was also Anne Barnhart um, had a, a lovely repost on her um, on her blog the the other day of of or yesterday because yeah, this is for the Feast of the Assumption where she's talking about the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption as scientifically. Um, necessary in, in, in sort of thinking about energy and light and so forth. But she has this wonderful passage where she's talking about, you know, what it what it, what it means to say um, Mary was the, the mother of our Lord and, you know, why she had to be immaculately conceived because from the very moment of her conception, she carries all of her eggs. <laughs> um, mm. That this is um, because... because um, uh, uh, what, uh, unlike women, uh, unlike men who are continuously producing new sperm, a woman's eggs aren't created and formed with each menstrual cycle. We have them when we're, when we're in the womb, which, which is of course the yes. horrible evil of all of the, the, the COVID shots um, being given to pregnant women, given, disrupting women's menstrual cycles. We have all of our, our eggs when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're in our own mother's womb, which means that Mary did, right? And so Mary was, from the time yes. she was inside St. Anne's womb, already carrying a portion of our Lord's physicality, namely 23 of his chromosomes. Yes. And thus, Mary was, from her very beginning, already a proto-tabernacle, <laughs> already the Ark of the New Covenant, carrying within her what would be consecrated into the law incarnate, the high priest and the mm. bread of life, just like the old Ark, except perfected and fully fulfilled as God incarnate. And as we know from the book of Exodus, the old ark had to be perfect. The part I just read, right? And thus the ark of the new covenant was truly perfect, except this perfection was a perfection that only God himself could accomplish. The perfection of Mary, full mm -hmm. of grace, and thus saved from all sin, including original sin. Um, and that perfection, think, thinking that... Um, God gives Moses the instructions on how to build the ark. God gives him the pattern on how to build this this yes. this vessel for his presence. That th I mean, that's what we understand of Mary. Of course, she's a creature of God. That's the whole. You know, we all are, right? He makes her yeah. to be his tabernacle, to be his ark, to be his mother, yes. and therefore she needs to be made perfect from from the beginning of time from beginning because she is his ark and, and i just I, I don't understand why this logic isn't completely clear but i like that barn i like that barnhart <laughs> points out there's a biological argument too in, in the sense of our carrying all of the eggs from our our own conception as women i mean the holiness yes. of women is in our carrying of life from the very moment of our life it's a continuous continuous mm. I'm talking about from Eve, right? This this continuous life. If we are alive now, absolutely every single one of our mothers was fertile. Yes. <laughs> Think of all the people who died without children, right? You are the 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 you know the, the Calvin and Hobbes, the you know, the the cartoon character, right? Calvin has this wonderful moment when he realizes all of history has been leading up to me. It's like it's true. <laughs> it's true. All of history has been leading up to you. Yeah. Absolutely every one of your your ancestors had children yes. there's no other way that you're here this glorious continuity of generations which the 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 scriptures also celebrate when all the begats right if you have the begat the begat the yes. begat the begat the begat the begat the begat you you are in the continuity of life from the very beginning mm. i don't think we take our first parents seriously enough frank frankly <laughs> <laughs> So there's so there's that it's the mother of all baked living. into baked into you know crafted into the script the gospel telling of who Mary is is this 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 temple mm. mystery and then the revelation of you know the ark has been lost I just said revelation hint hint um, 
the the ark is lost and now it you know it's longed for when the temple is restored the ark will be there present this is the vision that saint john has of that temple right um, and the temple of god was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple and there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail and a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars and being with child she cried travailing in birth and was in pain to be delivered and there was seen another sign in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and his head seven diadems and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered that when she should be delivered he might devour her son and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod and her son was taken up to god and to his throne now i know again there's a lot of tradition that says oh that's not mary right but let's look at what let's look mm. at the text right the ark is in the heaven the temple opens and the ark is seen in heaven in heaven is the woman with the crown um those who get caught up with the idea that one is chapter 11 and one is chapter 12 are giving the medieval commentators on scripture too much credit for numbering these things because <laughs> they they weren't <laughs> set they were it's a it's a continuous text there's the, the, these chapter mm -hmm. numbers come later certainly the verse numbers come come in the 13th century and so what you've seen is the temple opens the, do, the the doors of the temple open in heaven the ark is seen and there is the lady and she gives forth to the child who's going to rule the nations and who's threatened by the dragon now the whole cried mm. travailing in birth and was in pain to be delivered um now i'm off the top of my head why why do why are we convinced mary didn't have any pain giving birth i don't think it ever says that i think i think she gives birth but the 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 absolute detail of whether or not she gives that that is another of the christians are you know we're trying to figure out things that are not fully explained in harmony with things that are said and mm -hmm. um I'm not I'm not sure her giving birth without pain is actually in Luke. I don't think it is. So that's that that argument doesn't hold to say that that woman in in Apocalypse 12 is not Mary. That doesn't make sense. Mm. I got to go back to Luke now. I think she just gives birth. She does it does there's not an, anything but she gives birth in the inn in the in the in the in the, in the stable. And that's that. Well, her entire uh pregnancy was travailing in the sense that they were being hunted by the Herodians. Right. And of course, you know, the, the, the Our Lady suffers in her compassion with Christ at his death. Yes. So her travailing yes. at his birth, I mean, which birth is it? Um, we, you know, there, mm. there's, there's layers and layers there, but to, just saying that s certain of the arguments are used to prove that the woman Apocalypse 12 is not meant to, to show um the the ark's relationship to the christ don't work if the, if you're mm -hmm. if you're getting stuck on that particular part of the argument um but the the the, the ancient the, the the christians who are writing the new testament see christ is fulfilling the temple tradition they see him as the priest of the order of melchizedek they see mary in this temple context being greeted by elizabeth who's pregnant with john the baptist whose father served in the temple they see in revelation the temple restored with the ark there with the lady there all of this is just as much a part of the christian mystery as saying jesus is fulfilling the davidic kingship yes it's how uh christ and the the blessed virgin were depicted in all of those icons including the one from bowit mm -hmm. mm -hmm. she's always there she's always there right and because, and this, this gets to the very ancient liturgies of Mary, the queen mother verifies who the king is. And, and you know, and that, again, I've, I've had arguments online about this over the years, saying, well, the queen mother, that doesn't make her a goddess. And it's like, Mary's not a goddess. She's the mother of our Lord. And you mentioned that Solomon had many wives. Um, yes. That um, David's mother, Bathsheba, or sorry, Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, is, of course, not David's first wife. <laughs> 
and this this role of the queen mother seems to have been very very important in the ancient um, kingship that the mother you know verify so you say the mother verifies the the king and of course uh he's king because his father's dead so his his parent is still his mother his mother is there it, it, and in, yeah. in choosing texts for the Marian liturgies the main one that they choose is psalm 44 which describes this kind of relationship between the king who's receiving his bride and his mother standing by his throne in gold woven robes and and that is the mm. that's the very the most ancient liturgies of mary use that psalm as their their focus there she is she's standing mm. by his throne and and validating him in in the song of songs it's saying in his mother the king solomon comes forth with the crown with which his mother crowned him so the the presence of the uh the queen mother is a part of the confirmation of authority of royal authority in the sense right mm. right and that that's that confirmation tradition again it's a carry it carries into all of these ancient traditions it's very very prominent in the orthodox tradition um and you know it's specifically the the council of ephesus that confirms her title as theotokos is triggered by sermons that are being given by proclus of constantinople in constantinople um he's not of constantinople yet because he's not patriarch but um he's he's um he's he's talking about her as the the the, the you know the he has other images like the loom where the weaving happens the weaving imagery is very important mm -hmm. but always 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 she's the temple and she's this holy place where God, the lord becomes present and so mm -hmm. her her sacrality her holiness the holy is that which is polluting in this interesting way right anthropologically it's it's terrifying it's the place of of the the presence of the sacred therefore in for example her dermition stories when um she's carried out in from where she dies in jerusalem to the where she's the tradition where she's buried for a few days um the the mm. the jews who reject her as the mother of the messiah come and attack the beer and they get they get stuck to it right the, the high priest gets stuck to it because it's like he's attacked the ark it's, he's attacked he's attacked yes. this holy vessel um unlike Obadidim, who who hold, puts out his hand to steady the ark when it's being carried into Jerusalem and dies, uh, the the priest mm. in the the Marian stories who touches it, he's in pain and his hands stick to her beer, but he's healed. Um, when Peter says to him, you know, confess the that this is the mother of the of the Lord, and when he recognized he get in the in the most ancient stories they're the longest, right? He goes through how she he jesus is clearly fulfilling the scriptures and it's always that problem of jesus fulfills the scriptures therefore we know that he's the king that the scriptures are prophesying yes and and jesus is meaningless without that those fulfillments he can't just be a wonder working he can't just be a miracle working power guy he has to well, he then, has to be the fulfillment. he becomes a dc he becomes a dc superhero exactly then. there's no exactly. there's no there's no israel Without that dynasty, without that authority, without the uh, without lineage, he just becomes Superman. Right. <laughs> it's a, it sort of makes a cartoon out of the Messiah instead of a, a very real uh, royal, doesn't it? I I have a book by, that by a one of my neighbors in Chicago is it where he lived up in Evanston. Um, on the different the the Christ stories in the embedded in all the superhero narratives, he he does a ch he mm -hmm. does a chart deciding which ones are Gnostic and which ones are Aryan, <laughs> which was we actually should quite we should we could we could totally do this Jim Papandreou's book of, yeah. of the the superheroes and I gave it to a class once and they were they were a little irritated. I mean, it's 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 good reading it's good reading stuff with Chicago students because you get a true mixture of perspectives and they all argue everything out and they're always less persuaded than I am and I'm like oh, okay guys you, yeah you're probably right that 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 needed work but um, in fact our superhero stories are typically we started in our discussion talking about how Christ you know can be confused with these ancient divine kings 
but he's different. Mm -hmm. And now our confusion will be, oh, well, he's basically a superhero. We want him to be a superhero. We want him somehow to be a superhero. Always, it's like, remember what we said at the beginning, too, about how, you know, our, our theological failings seem to repeat themselves. <laughs> Here is another golden calf. Oh, goody. Right? The, that God has been showing himself over and over and over again in these mysteries, and we keep making the same mistakes. We keep wanting Pharaoh, and what we get is, in fact, the mosaic arc. I, I think I think that was just our conclusion. Let's let's <laughs> let's let's look at the uh, what uh, what have they been saying? Casey Casey is the queen. Can okay, we queen of Sheba? Yes. Crossroads of the whole civilized world at the time. Top Ethiopian men have the ark. Top men, and indeed, it's only men. They don't allow any women anywhere near it, and and it's no. only a very no. select group of men who serve the shrine where it's kept. Um, so, so it's 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 quite the thing that you never get to see. Our Lady is the Ark of the New Covenant, absolutely. So, I saw a painting in D.C. recently that shows this mystery in an Italian form from, I think it's the 14th century. I made you look it up. It's Gaudi, right? And this, this is one of my, it, this, is, this painting is, in fact, in the United States, so you can go see it if you're in D.C. Um, 1390, so late 14th century. Um, Agnolo Gaudi, Florentine artist. And every time I see this this painting, it, it simply takes my breath away because it is so perfect in evoking this heavenly mystery that we've been talking about and talking through. And it's Mary assumed into heaven being crowned by her son. So receiving the crown as his mother that we recognize the Solomonic queen mother carries. Um, and he's Solomon, obviously, but then surrounded by angels, right? And it, it's easy to take the angels as, as decorative elements instead of recognizing they're the cherubim <laughs> that look at each other on the ark. And that I, you know, I love that in, in the Gaudi painting, they're playing instruments, right? They're playing lutes. I think they're lutes. Yeah, the, the, the fullness of the, the uh, Levitical image is there, if you can read it. Precisely. Uh, in that lens. It's not a new thing. This is uh, this is this is the religion of Israel realized in flesh. Right. And this is and this mm. is Mary as the the Ark, and I mean Gaudi is all, he's trying to show how Mary is, is the perfect reflection of Christ. For those you know biological mm. reasons that we were talking about, you know, she gives him all her flesh, all his flesh. The twenty three chromosomes, yes. the egg. Is, is from her flesh. And so in medieval meditations, the, the understanding is always she looks exactly like him, that, that, that she is mm -hmm. his most perfect reflection. So there's lots of wonderful imagery of her as the mirror and um, that when she's contemplating him, she holds him in her understanding and in, in this perfect reflection. But there's the physical reflection that he is truly incarnate through her. So all of that perfection mm -hmm. in the pattern that Moses is shown to make the ark out of the incorrupt wood, the setim wood and the gold and so forth. That's also used figurally and, and, and analog analogously to understand if she is the true ark, she's going to be incorrupt. I mean, the, the idea of set, the setim mm. wood and the gold was that, that do, I mean, it doesn't decay. And so in the mystery, she is lifted as the ark back up into heaven because she is the the ark of the covenant she's 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 <laughs> well, his a, she's his simple... vessel but what you know it, it's so it's so fascinating that we say you know merely a vessel what did what can you be possibly be saying yeah. about that when she carried our lord exactly i was just about to say that <laughs> it's a simple thing to think about it how can somebody decay after holding the creator in her womb that doesn't make any sense <laughs> Well, and having carried, you know, having carried the eggs that, you know, one of which became yeah. his body, you don't, you did, mm -hmm. and, and this is again, the medieval mystery. And this is why, again, the early Christians end up with lots of stories about her dormition and what happens to her after, 
after she dies, whether she falls asleep, whether she's taken to paradise, whether she's resurrected, how many days after. But the, the conviction is, is, is regularly that she's, she's got to be in heaven somehow. And Barnhart in her, yes. in her meditation goes on and, and thinking about how, you know, this, this has to do with, she says, um, call me faithless, but I take profound joy in every scientific discovery that confirms dogma. This has to be at the tippy top. There is new data demonstrating that subatomic particles eventually break down into a waveform, like light, without any actual <laughs> mass, which would very clearly point to the transformation of substance in the Eucharist. I'll write that up if there's any further yeah. confirmation. For now, enjoy contemplating the mind-blowing reality of the science of the assumption, a feast so high that entire swaths of the post-Christian West and the Old World still shut down every August 15th. Her assumption is our promise, mm. and the science behind it should bring every mother, including every woman who murdered a child in utero, to her knees in awesome fear and trembling. So with that meditation, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you for helping us think through what it means to honor Our Lady as the Ark of our Lord and hoping that next year we all observe the Feast of Her Assumption with appropriate solemnity. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> it's hard. Thank it's, you. It's hard to it's hard to end without you know saying, "Aw, hail Mary. hail Mary, kaira kaira tomene." If I can learn to hail. say it in Greek, we need to learn to say it in Coptic. Yes. Hail <laughs> Mary. Amen. <laughs>